thou face that I have the distinct pleasure of introducing someone I have great admiration and respect for, uh, Doug Hooker, who is most recently the CEO of Midtown Connected Park, uh, MCP Foundation, and they are working to transform a 17-acre park in the heart of Atlanta. We're going to hear a little bit about that. Um, but a couple of things about Doug. First off, for many of you who are Georgia Techers, fellow Georgia Tecker, um, professor of practice at Georgia State, uh, master's at Emory University, so uh, many of you have, have had education in those areas. Um, there was a quote in his bio that I'm going to read very quickly. It says, Atlanta has been my home in my career. I have an insatiable passion for this city and its people. Um, I don't know of anybody who's had more dedication and more leadership uh, to the city of Atlanta and the metro Atlanta region. His work in the Atlanta Regional Commission was exemplary, and, and his legacy there is growing. His work with uh, the Community Foundation of Atlanta. And very, very importantly, here at South Face, we have a lot of musicians, and we love music at South Face. It's kind of part of, of who we are. Uh, almost to an individual, and we've got many uh, talented musicians and many aspirational musicians, but Doug is not only an oboist, but is a composer and has composed a symphony um, called Without Regard to Sex, Race, and Color, and uh, I hope we're going to share a little bit about that as well, but join me in welcoming Doug. Thank you. Thanks, James. Thank you. Uh, thank you, James, and thank you all for having me. Uh, Thanks to Carol and Tricia for getting me set up and going. I appreciate that a great deal. Uh, I usually like to walk while I talk, but I got to stay close to the computer here to flip my slide. So I'll be a little bit more of a statue this afternoon. Um, so when, when uh, reflecting on what to talk about to share with you today, James asked me to consider talking about the Midtown Connector Project, which I'm going to tell you the name has changed, by the way. Um, and a little bit about my career and then any career advice or thoughts I might want to offer. And so I'm going to do exactly that. The uh, project, by the way, is now called the Atlanta Connector Park. And because the name may change again, we're just the Connector Park Foundation. Okay, so for what that's worth. Um, but call, whatever you want to call us, it's fine, as long as you think about it. But I want to talk about the Connector Park in a scope of a larger picture of what I think is happening in urban placemaking in America, and I call it placemaking in 3D. Uh, and I think this is a, a, a rethinking of our relationship with automobiles, and we certainly have been doing that for the last 20 to 30 years, uh, or excuse me, the last 10 to 20 years, very actively on the uh, street network grid. But I think we're also beginning to think about it in terms of relationship with the automobile and the highway and all that infrastructure, thousands and thousands of miles and square miles that we have devoted to, to cars and only to cars. And I think we're beginning to rethink how we might reuse some of that space in a different way. I'm going to talk about two projects that were early on in this process that I call coincidental uh, street making. It wasn't the intent to remake the space for people. It was the intent to do something with a transportation facility. And as a consequence, they decided to do something with the remaining space. And then we started getting into the 1990s and early 2000s, and we started getting intentional about it. And I'm going to share a bunch of projects that were early on in the intentionality where communities were saying to their DOTs and to themselves, what do we do with this space that's more than just the automobile? So I'm going to talk about that and then talk about the history of the Connector Park a little bit. You with me? Yeah. All right. Uh, if somebody would do me the favor, I set my timer for 40 minutes, but I don't want to keep playing with my phone while I'm on camera. So if you just do me a favor and let me know when 40 minutes are getting close. All right. So, oh, too fast. So anybody aware of or you remember or know of the name The Big Dig? Mm -hmm. All right. The Big Dig project was about what? It was about taking I-91 or 93, whichever that facility is, that went through the heart of Boston that was extremely congested and actually lowering the, the uh, expressway for a couple of miles segment through Boston, through the heart of Boston. And they wanted to do that so it wouldn't keep interfering with traffic 
at the surface level. And so that was the project I embarked upon in the 1980s. It eventually got done in the late 1990s, early 2000s. But as a part of doing that, it's like, well, what happens with all this space that's at the surface now? And they made the decision, they, the Boston community along with Mass DOT, to turn it into a greenway. And so we have the Rose Kennedy Greenway. If anybody's ever been to Boston, you know, this beautiful, beautiful long facility that goes here. It's roughly 25 acres. And underneath it is an expressway, which if you were walking there, you wouldn't know that there's a highway underneath there, okay? And then, 1989, any baseball fans here? What was famous about 1989 in baseball lore? It was the Earthquake World Series. The Oakland Athletics were playing the San Francisco Giants for the World Series, and in the middle of one of their games, there came this huge shaking and rumbling. They were actually in Oakland at the time. This shaking and rumbling, and they quickly realized it's an earthquake, and it stopped the game. Now, the earthquake wasn't centered in Oakland. It was centered more on the San Francisco side of the Bay Area, and not directly in San Francisco, but close enough that it did a lot of damage. And one of the things that damaged was a state freeway called the Embarcadero, Embarcadero Freeway. And so, the Embarcadero Freeway was well known, and it was despised, but it was also well known. It was a double-decker. So the original freeway, and then they had built another expressway on top of it, parallel, and it ran through what was then, and what is still now, downtown San Francisco. But the earthquake took it out. Unfortunately, one person died in that. Several people got injured. Um, and so they said, well, we got to tear it out, at least this section. Are we going to put it back in? And the San Francisco community thought very proactively and said, no, we don't want to put it back in at all. It blocks the access to the waterway. It's a bunch of warehouses, a bunch of, it's not good human space, you know. It has some usefulness, but that utility does not supplant what we need in terms of raising the human experience in this area. And so, they never rebuilt the Embarcadero Freeway. And instead, if you've ever been to San Francisco and been in the waterfront and seen all the wharf district area, that's what's there now instead of the freeway. But again, they didn't plan to take down the freeway. It was coincidental because an earthquake knocked it down and they said, well, let's not rebuild it. And they made this great urban space that so many people uh, enjoy. So that's what I say kind of coincidental. But then we start being intentional in this idea of what do we do with this freeway space, okay? We still got to use it for highways in parts, but does it have to only be used for highways? And with that, one of the earliest uh, concepts of, of building over the expressway came from uh, a community in the state of Washington. It's the city of Mercer Island. Mercer Island's a little island between Seattle, Washington, and Bellevue, Washington. Bellevue's on the east, Seattle's on the west, and Mercer Island sits in between them. Um, and Washington DOT, WashDOT in the lingo, was planning to do work on the expressway that came through there, and I don't remember the, the facility number. Do I have it up there? Yeah, I-90. Okay. And the community was demanding for all of the inconvenience that it was going to do the housing was going to take out and everything else. What are you doing to mitigate our community for the damage being done by this reconstruction? We understand that you got to do it. I think they were widening it, I think, or something like that. But what are you going to do to mitigate? And what they worked out, negotiated uh, with Washington DOT is lower the dang on thing and build a park over the top. Now, they actually have other uses beside the park. It was a multi-beneficial thing, but the park was kind of the main feature that came out of that negotiation. Um, and it was called, at the time, it was called Lid Park, L-I-D Park. And it was the first one like it in the nation that was intentionally done. It was renamed uh, Aubrey Davis Park because Aubrey Davis was the mayor that led this charge for the community needs to be compensated for this work. 
And so they built this. And so here is the freeway. And it actually comes under here and goes out that way. And you see these things are actually ventilation for, for uh, vehicle emissions there. Um, but then here is a park. You see tennis courts, this lawn area. It goes back in here where they have uh, baseball fields, softball fields. So they were very intentional about it. So now we're starting to think about mm, maybe we just don't want to just leave the space just as a two-dimensional thing. Maybe we need to start thinking about it as a three-dimensional thing. And what can we do in the space above where the automobiles go? Another project that started in the uh, late 90s and was finished in the in uh, early 2000s was what we now call the uh, uh, Clyde Warren Park. It was originally uh, Woodall Rogers Park because it sits on top of the Wood Woodall Rogers Freeway, which is actually a state highway in Texas. And Texas DOT agreed to do this, helped contribute a part of the construction costs. It was opened up um, uh, roughly 10 years ago. And it's become kind of the model that a lot of communities around the country that are now contemplating this concept. Uh, Clyde Warren's kind of becoming the, uh, I don't want to say the grandparent, but it's the, the, the forerunner that everybody's looking to more so than the uh, Aubrey Davis uh, thing. So it connects uptown Dallas with the downtown Dallas. And uptown Dallas was not a poor neighborhood, but they were a neighborhood, but they were separated from the downtown area by the freeway. Um, and so some folks from the Dallas community leader said, let's build a, a park on top of Woodall Freeway, which Dex Texas DOT had determined to lower it anyway. Um, and let's be intentional about connecting the downtown and the arts district with uptown with this park. And so this is Clyde Warren Park here, and it has completely electrified downtown Dallas. It's hardly a day you can go in Dallas now and not find a lot of activity in this park. There's also a high school for the arts here. Um, and as I said, it's the arts district. And it really, everybody will tell you that this park has completely transformed so much of downtown Dallas uh, and downtown Dallas activity. So there are now more of these in the pipeline that are under development around the country. Southern Gateway Park is another one that's being done in Dallas. Having done the first one, Clyde Warren, Texas DOT is now much more open to doing more of these. And so there's an, uh, an effort to do Southern Gateway Park uh, as a part of work that Texas DOT did to widen I-35 through a part of Dallas. It had already, when it was originally constructed, it had already uh, decimated in a historic African-American uh, neighborhood, community. And so they said, let's work with the community and build a reconnection back on top of what we're doing. And Texas DOT contributed greatly to, uh, or has contributed greatly to this uh, effort. And so this project, they're expecting to be open to the public uh, in early to mid-2025. But again, being intentional about it, Kansas City has one underway um, that they are working on. It did not disconnect a community, as I understand it, but they decided as a part of their re-energizing uh, the downtown to just make, uh, to, to do this over, uh, it's a, a circular expressway, and I can't remember the three numbers, 675, 635, something like that. So they've got one underway. Philadelphia broke ground um, this summer in June on the park at Penn's Landing, which goes over I-95, will go over I-95, and it'll connect downtown Philadelphia to the Delaware River. When I-95 was built, much of the downtown area was cut off from direct access to the river. So their intentionality is to make that connection, reestablish that connection to the river and to revitalize through having this park and civic space um, so you can go directly from downtown Dallas to the river or back again. So 
So a lot of these are now being rethought. And in fact, uh, the, the Seattle City Council uh, just earlier this year passed a resolution to do another park, so uh, another lid park. So they have Mercer Island, which is technically the city of Mercer Island. But now Seattle's going to do one themselves. So a lot more communities are beginning to think about this concept, making space in three dimension for what was originally done only in two dimensions and dedicated to a single use. Now let's make something accessible to other uses and other aspects and make a more vibrant community fabric as a result of it. We have three of these concepts going in Atlanta. I think you're familiar with all three of these. Hub 404, that's intended to be over part of Georgia 400 uh, in the Buckhead area. The Stitch, which is intended to be downtown, not far from here, actually. And you guys are probably more familiar with that than I am. And then Atlanta Connector Park. So now a little bit about Atlanta Connector Park. It is not a brand new concept. This concept of having a linear park uh, was first floated by an, a landscape architect named Roy Ashley. And he came to Mayor Maynard Jackson, then in, Mayor's, in Maynard's third term, and it was in 1992. And I know this because I was the Commissioner of Public Works for the city at this point in time. The mayor asked me about this. Mr. Ashley had proposed that in advance of the Olympics, in anticipation of the Olympics, let's build this nice long linear park that would start south of the capital area, covering the connector, go all the way up to what we then used to call Brookwood Station, it's now Atlantic Station or 17th Street. So he had envisioned this concept back in the early 90s. And he probably saw it happening in Mercer Island and some other places, but it's not brand new that it just happened. It, and Midtown Connector Park is what he envisioned as phase one, and he called it the institutional district right next to Georgia Tech. Long before Tech Square began to happen on the east side, right? Uh, let's see here. All right. So the Atlanta Connector Park, we got intentional. When I started in January of this year as the uh, leader of this effort, they, they had been working on this for about four years before me, uh, before I came on board. The original concept was proposed to be from North Avenue up to 10th Street. And it was going to do a lot of... Um, at collector distributor lanes on the east side and the west side of the expressway. And it was gonna reestablish a uh, east-west street grid at 3rd Street, 4th Street, 6th Street, and 8th Street. Streets that used to be part of the city before the connector was built, okay? Um, and that was an enticing thought that maybe this could actually solve a transportation problem at the same time you're, you're putting in a, a new park space. But after studying it, it turns out that the transportation benefits from the, the interstate uh, were marginal. You would get improved flow through from, from, us, from 10th Street down to uh, William Street, actually. But then the traffic could just pile up and be worse going around the Grady Curve. And so DOT cited, well, we don't have a solution for the Grady Curve. It's not in our capital program right now. So the benefits are relatively minor compared to the cost of us doing this. Also at the same time, Georgia Tech was saying, we have spent the last 50 years pushing the automobile to the periphery of campus, right, Carol? So you don't get a lot of cars directly in the middle of campus. When I was started at campus, there used to be a big street called Hemp Hill that, that divided the main campus area from the new student center. And it was a four lane road that people would would speed down, and it was always a hazard trying to cross Hemp Hill to get to the student center where our mailboxes were and our entertainment was. So Tech has spent the last 50 years pushing the automobile to the periphery. Well, that 3rd Street, 4th Street, 6th Street, and 8th Street, reestablishing the grid east-west, would just put all those automobiles right back onto the middle of campus. And they said, we really don't want any part of that. So um, by the time I came along, 
Tech and DOT had pushed back to the, or counter proposed to the Connected Park Foundation that let's just go from fifth, from north to fifth and take the, all the automobile transportation elements out and just make it purely a park. We'll work with you on that. So that's what I came on, that's when I came on board January this year. And the uh, first thing I said to, to our chief sponsor, our chief sponsor, by the way, is Dan Caffey of Chick-fil-A fame. I said, I don't want to call it Midtown Connected Park. It's not Midtown's park. It happens to physically be in the Midtown area, but it is Atlanta's park. And it's for everybody um, in the city and the region. So, so this is what bird's eye view is looking down from North Avenue. That's the varsity. I know you've never been there before. Uh, Fifth Street, and this is Tech Square up here, or down here, I should say, excuse me. So the idea, if I can get it to advance, ah, the idea is to put a park, and it's not 17 acres, which is our bad press. It's only 12 and a half acres. Um, but Starting just slightly south of North Avenue, we do actually extend and put a little pocket green space to match the green space area you have here north of Fifth Street. Um, and we have this park about half a mile long, so what it, roughly what it is. A lot of people don't realize when you're driving, you really don't pay attention to the undulations of the expressway, but it actually rises to a high point here and falls back down again. You can walk, you'll be able to access it at street level here at 5th Street and here at North Avenue. So think about coming off of the North Avenue Marta Station, block and a half, you're right, entrance of the park. So the way we envision the programming for the park is to have what we call we space and me space. And our we spaces are at the South Pole and the North Pole. And why? One, easy pedestrian access. Um, on grade. Let's make this more family oriented. Probably fits in more with the campus culture as well. Uh, have a waiting pond there for kids to play in or anybody for that matter, but um, thinking about keeping it shallow safety for, for children. Having this as a playground area and picnic area, a cloud pavilion people can run through, get themselves dashed off. Make this the larger civic space, um, and there will eventually be a pavilion over it, uh, but it's a hardscape plaza that can accommodate up to 2,000 people. And then the Great Lawn is what we think about this green space, can handle 4,000 people. So you could have a public speaker, you could have a concert, whatever else, um, and there would be a cafe, some uh, a visitor center, and some other kinds of things this end. And then in the middle where it rises, we would have trails to get uh, off into quiet spaces where you can sit, reflect, read, and know you're in the city but not be in the city because uh, you're away from a lot of automobile traffic and everything else. And we envision having uh, a water feature here that uh, I'll show you here in a minute. So. South, looking north, there's Grant Field on the west there and Midtown on the east. And so it'd be something like this. Um, and then on the east, looking west, about middle of the project, it would look approximately like that. And then inside the park, this is, um, we envision a, a, a fifth of a mile track elevated that you could walk around, get exercise. It actually served also as standing room only space for a public event if facing the other way, north, or if you just want to overlook the activity in the south of the park, what's happening on the great lawn and beyond. And then so here's that track concept that we have. This is in the south end entrance off of North Avenue. 
the idea of, uh, again, a wading pool. We even fancy ourselves bringing in sand in June and from June to through Labor Day, making this a little uh, in-city beach. We don't know if we're going to do that. Just <laughs> flights of fancy, right? You, you, you want to dream big when you do these things. This is that water wall area I was talking about, kind of simulates waterfalls. Um, and we'd have lots of places around here where people can sit, sit in the middle of the day, reflect, read a book, just enjoy being outside without having to be bothered with a lot of things. Um, so is this real? I hope it's real. I'm trying to make it real. That's part of my job. Uh, we, believe that, uh, uh, we believe that if we can get the money together in the next three years, three and a half years, that we could launch into construction, uh, after World Cup in 2026, this doesn't show that, but World Cup would actually be somewhere in there, but we would hold off starting construction until after World Cup. Um, and then in a matter of, of 24 to uh, 30 months, late 2028, we could be doing a ribbon cutting. But what's it going to take to do that? We've got a long way to go. The project budget is about $590 million. It's what we estimate. It's a very conservative budget. We actually believe um, that we have a lot of padding in this and that the real cost will be less unless something pops up that we don't know about. Um, the deck area is where we think we have the best room for savings. We are turning in, within two weeks, we'll be turning in our engineering concept report to DOT for them to review, give their feedback, and ultimately their approval, which we hope to get uh, first or second quarter of next year, and then we'll actually be close to also getting our environmental permit with that. Um, so the deck, uh, we think, we hope to be largely publicly funded with federal uh, public dollars, maybe some local public dollars, and the part itself to be a mix of public and private funds, mostly private funds that we will start doing a quiet phase uh, campaign late next year. And then the pavilion, whatever we ultimately come up with as the cover, will be 100% privately funded. Oh, am I going backward? Apparently I am. All right, so, so next year we'll be launching into kind of really announcing ourselves a lot more so. Of course, people have heard about the project off and on um, for the last four, four or five years, but um, doing a big push on community outreach, public information next year, uh, financing our, um, excuse me, finalizing our financing plan and beginning our pursuit of federal grant funding. Um, com starting our detailed design, we already have the design procurement document developed. GDOT's already approved it. We're just waiting till we get the completion of our engineering report um, and near the com uh, our environmental clearance so we can get started with that. Um, and a few other things like that. So, now, any questions about any of that before I go on? No, no, and the reason why is that within a half a mile mm -hmm. of the park site on the east side in Midtown, there are more than 10,000 parking spaces. We're not building this park to accommodate the automobile, and we want to make sure we're making a real statement about that. There's enough parking that's mostly under private control, and we think that the uses of the park after work hours primarily and on weekends is counter to when most people are using, uh, you know, commercial office buildings. So we think that a lot of parking space will be freed and available if those private owners decide to make it available for park parking. Forget my redundancy there. Um, and we think that that's, the, we think the market will just naturally go there. Um, so. Well, of course, people Absolutely. Absolutely. We, we, we will really be stressing that, yeah. Uh, and, and one of our uh, early meetings next year is actually with MARTA's TOD, Transfer and Development Team, 
uh, because the North Avenue station is on their schedule for one of their redevelopment things. So they're going to build above it, uh, prob probably housing is our understanding, but that's what we want to confirm with them and find out how we can stay in closer communication as we develop. So, yes, sir. Yes. No, we, we think the park O&M is actually fairly traditional. Uh, we're looking at parks that have water features because actually the water features tend to drive up the, the operation and maintenance costs. They can get really crazy and glitchy so the plumbing can get, be a problem. Um, so we'll be looking at that very closely. The, pinning down the O&M costs uh, is one of our goals for next year, especially early next year. Um, we actually are in, in um, talks with a potential sponsor who's willing to underwrite most of the O&M, or at least says they're willing to underwrite most of the O&M for the first 10 to 20 years of the project, which if we can get that and have that as a solid commitment, then that's a gift to the city to say, when we open this, we can open it without you having to think about it being in your budget, at least for the next however many years, right? So, um, so we'll see. But it's a great, it, it's, a, it's a really critical uh, thing that we do have to be able to answer. Yes, ma'am. Um, so obviously there are many community metastructures. Do you think one of these is environmental? Absolutely, hazardous? absolutely. Uh, so, uh, we expect that there will be well over 500 trees planted in here along with whatever shrubs and native uh, flower species that we'll be planting. Uh, we we're, want to be very mindful on how we utilize this space to uh, help promote environmental um, uh, benefits. So in addition to the tree planting and everything that we think will help the, uh, help the air quality, at least locally, uh, we also believe that it will lower the herb, urban heat, heat island effect from 7 to 10 degrees. Um, studies from other parks have suggested that that might be the uh, impact. We're going to actually have a firm that specifically studies that for us next year so we can quantify that. We plan to capture the rainwater that normally falls on the highway onto the park, put it in cisterns. There will be cisterns in our design that um, we can take part of the water treat it and reuse it for the water features. Um, and then you have the rest released slowly into the local stormwater system. So, uh, so those are some of the things that we're imagining with it. Yeah. So um, going on and, and you can ask other questions about the park later. I'm, I'm not trying to cut them off, but I want to be sure that I honor the rest of this uh, presentation. So as James said, you have 30 minutes. Oh, okay. Okay. I won't take 30 minutes, I promise. Um, he quoted that, that statement from me, and that's because that is a quote that I once said to an employer. So I won't say which employer it is, but it was a private sector employer that wanted to hire me to run their Atlanta offices. And, and the president was doing this interview himself, the president of the company. And he said, everybody says you're the person we should hire, but I can't make sense of your career. Because you started with Georgia Power, you went back to grad school, you've worked for a private manufacturing company, then you worked for the city, and then you worked for a small engineering firm. I can't make sense of your career. I said, well, the thing you want to know is that I will do a good enough job that you'll want to promote me and have me come to headquarters for a job, and I'm not moving. Because Atlanta is my career. Atlanta has been my career. And that is, in fact, been the single guiding thread. That plus challenging myself as a leader and putting myself in different situations to learn leading in different situations, public, private, large, small, require different kinds of skills, leadership skills, and learning that about myself, testing that about myself, but always using every position I have to see what I can do to help benefit the community. So that's been my guiding thread. So I call this part of my talk community love 
one man's journey. So I'm not going to go through all the details of my career, um, but whatever the pointer is, thank you. Um, I'll just offer a few uh, highlights. Now I'm going to say I'm going to point out a bunch of infrastructure and programmatic things here, but honestly, as far as I'm concerned, my biggest, the things I'm most proud of are the people that I've advised and mentored along the way. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily call out their names, but um, it's a joy to me to offer a perspective for people, um, share my experience and help them learn in ways that help them grow personally or professionally or both. Um, and so I don't put that on here, but know that those are the number one things that I take uh, at the end of career, end of life when that time comes. But here are some of the things that, I, that I've uh, worked on been a part of leading or helping to do through my career that I'm very proud of. Um, I won't touch on all of them, but since we're environmental here, I'll say that uh, I was deputy commissioner. I was the first deputy commissioner of public works for the city of Atlanta. And one of my first tasks was to lead the launch of our recycling program. So I'm very proud of that. I still have my original recycling bin. It's ratty and mocked up, but um, something that will not be written up in history books, but was critically important from a community perspective for me is when I finished my work at the city and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do next, a dear friend of mine who was deputy superintendent at APS for everything except instruction. So she had construction, uh, transportation, nutrition, IT, and all that. And she said, I want you to come over here and be my facilities director. Our school renovation program is in a huge mess. And I said, no, I'm not going to work for your board because your board is a bunch of crazy people. <laughs> and she said, well, come over and be my consultant. I said, that I'll do. And so for four years, I was her consultant, helping her to work the politics so that we could work the engineering of turning around a school construction program. Uh, it was an East Bloss funded bond program. Uh, they were in year three when I came on board. It was supposed to be year three, year, year three of a five-year program. Only a third of the schools had been done, and the first set of schools that had been done were already beginning to fall apart. And so I was very proud to help turn that around, bring it in, help her bring it in under the original budget, um, and have quality products. So I'm very proud of that. And in the process, we convinced the school board not to tear down the Carver High School campus, which was what they were originally planning to do. So it's a beautiful old historic facility. And by the way, you may not know about it, but the Atlanta Housing Authority is getting ready to redo the homes on Pryor Street into a mixed income community. So you're about to tear down a high school right at about the time, two or three later, you're going to get a flood of new school and new students. It makes no sense. At that point in time, the school board, housing authority, the city, all work in silos and hardly ever talk to each other except when they had a problem and then it was yelling across each other. So, um, so bringing a little knowledge of what was happening in the community helped us talk to the school board in preserving that. Um, transportation. Uh, I was the uh, executive director for the State Road and Tollway Authority, CERTA, for three years, and we initiated to... Uh, to the dismay of Georgia DOT, we initiated a study of high occupancy toll lanes and truck only toll lanes, looking at their capital plans. And at that point in time, they had very little money and they were running out of discretionary cash. And I knew that because CERTA was the bond holder for DOT. We would sell bonds because we could have income to guarantee those bonds or underwrite those bonds. They could not allow it to be done by state law and turn over the cash for them for their programs. And what I knew because I had to get their, their quarterly financial reports that they were running out of discretionary cash. And so I said to the commissioner, why don't you let CERTA study your projects and see which ones might be partially or wholly supported by a, a toll, you know, high occupancy toll, a uh, managed lane kind of approach. Um, they went along with that. They didn't want to pay anything for it, but they provided technical support as did Greta, Georgia Regional Transportation Authority, and ARC. 
And what came out of that was that a system of managed lanes once put in place could really help with the overall flow in the uh, freeway network in Metro Atlanta. So much so that the DOT board, DOT board adopted as a policy to be sure every new uh, facility, interstate facility in metro area and in Savannah was studied as a toll project to see if there's some possibility it could be supported by uh, tolls, finance. So that led to the managed lane system plan that, that DOT and ARC are now operating off of. So it's just requiring us, to, not requiring, but encouraging us to think differently about how we do things. So that's been one of my roles. I was on the inaugural board for the Metro uh, North Georgia Water Planning District. And when I went to ARC, of course, we provide a lot of technical support for them for that. Primarily, a lot of technical and litigation support, uh, mostly to the state in the Tri-State Water War. And that work has proven out, proven itself over and over again, as every court decision has basically fallen in favor of the state of Georgia, largely based upon the technical work that we did um, in ARC in support of the state's position. Um, so yeah, finding the Flint, uh, working with Hannah Palmer at the very beginning of the concept and helping to get that rolling. I was very pleased with that. That's long term, but a lot of the stuff I like doing is systems change um, and community or place change that will have a long-term trajectory. Uh, but, you know, it's those things you have to do and have faith that you may not live to see all of the benefits, but believe that it's possible. So, um, and then Chattahoochee Riverlands, I'm sure you guys are probably well familiar with that. Um, and then a few other things uh, coming toward the end of my career here, or to end, end of my formal career, um, helping to work with the Georgia Health Policy Center, uh, Georgia State Health Policy Center, excuse me, Kaiser Permanente United Way to, oh, to LART, launch Archie, the Atlanta Regional Collaboration for Health Improvement, if you're not familiar with it, but it's, it was the first of large civic-based collaborators, collaborations that we have helped to launch, we, ARC, and me in leading that, um, to address systems issues um, and inequities in black and white life. And this was around health disparities. Um, and Archie is going full board now, has over 80 members, both hospitals, um, health care systems and nonprofits, as well as ARC, United Way continue to be part of it. Learn for Life, which is an educational collaborative that, uh, that uh, ARC and I helped to find, found, uh, working closely with uh, Ann Kramer. I don't know if you know that name, Ann Kramer, but she's a civic leader who used to be with IBM who focused on education um, amongst her history of work. But Ann Kramer and I led this effort um, and ended up being a collaboration along with the Metro Chamber, United Way, and Community Foundation, and ARC to establish this nonprofit to get educators to talk about how the private sector could help them outside of the classroom or even learn best practices from each other inside the classroom. The first meeting we had with the eight school superintendents that are part of this collaboration was the first time any of them had ever been in a room with one another. And we asked them, what do you have in common? And let's talk about how we can plan a long range trajectory of improving your circumstances that make it easier for you to teach children and help them learn based upon the science and the best practices of educational um, in, in throughout the nation. And so that's what Learn for Life is. We actually were seeing significant improvements. We started with third grade reading and eighth grade math as our central things. And then we went to graduation rates and then also focusing on helping a lot of young people make the transition from graduating into a post high school technical education, whether it's, I mean, a career, whether it's university, whether it's two years or a, a certi cert certification. A lot of young people coming through the APS system and the other systems 
don't have the family resource to help them navigate how to do that. And I don't mean necessarily money, but just experience and knowledge of how to help them. And so a lot of young people kind of are making that, trying to make that transition into their early adulthood by themselves. And so that's one of the things we focus on. COVID set us back tremendously, but we're back at it. We have a method that we know works, generally speaking, and I have hopes that that will be um, really foundational for the long range improvement of our community. Um, Atlanta Aerotropis Alliance, trying to get the Southern Metro cities and counties to work closely together. They had a history of competing against each other and they were too small to compete with their northern neighbors, north of I-20 neighbors. And so the proposition was, we can do more together if you work more closely together as a common block because city A can't spend tax dollars to promote something good in city B. County two can't necessarily spend tax dollars to pursue a employer for county one, but through a non profit partnership, Aero ATL, you can help promote what's good about and you use your membership dollars and we can spend it wherever it needs to be to help promote because if it's good for one, it helps all in the region and we're beginning to see the benefits of that. Um, and now I'm at a stage in life, I'm the, uh, the uh, chairman of the board of the Community Foundation for Greater Atlanta and I'm also on the uh, Atlanta Housing Authority commissioners and I am fortunate to be able to help coordinate with them or help them coordinate with each other and coordinate with the city on working on housing affordability. We're putting a lot of things into place. We probably have a much more collaborative environment around housing affordability than any other place in the country. Um, when we talk about what we're doing, uh, we're not finding it matched by others. Uh, a lot of places, especially a lot of housing authorities are envious of the relationship that we have with City Hall that is respectful, independent but respectful, and relationships of, that we have with Community Foundation and just the total focus of this community on bending that housing affordability curve, which we know is a huge problem. I hope when it's all said and done, I'll be able to help lead to delivery of a new park that's still to be decided. So um, now, a few little thoughts here, leadership lessons. First leadership lesson I got from a teacher, and that teacher used to always say, children don't care what you know until they know that you care. All of us are still children at our core, in some ways, emotionally. And most employees, most people I've found in my, in my work, respond better to leadership that cares about them as individuals, rather than just what the job is that they're doing. And so I've always tried to lead from, who is the whole human being coming to work with me each day? not just a person in a job position. I mean, I have found that to benefit me um, as a coworker and as a leader. Second one is uh, learn to build stonewall organizations, not brick walls. Well, what does that mean? What's the difference between a stone and a brick? Bricks are all the same shape, all the same size often all the same color for a particular building. Stones vary. Nature's made stones big, small, short, fat, thick, thin, different dimensions, different strengths, which lasts longer in our human experience. Stone walls or brick walls? Stone wall. Great Wall of China still standing. There's stone walls throughout history that are hundreds and thousands of years old very few brick things last that long. And people aren't bricks, we, are, we aren't all the same. We're different shapes, different sizes and everything else. So I've always tried to find good people to work with and figure out how to help them make their best contribution to the organization that I'm blessed to lead. So try to build a stone wall organization, not a brick wall organization, much more resilient. And then the third one, um, which really helped me cement some years ago how I show up best for people. I have uh, two brothers. One of them one day asked me, he's my intellectual partner. We go back and forth with each other all the time. 
and we were traveling to Memphis to see our father, and he said, Doug, what are you the possibility of? I said, what do you mean, what am I the possibility? How do you show up? How do you show up in life, in every conversation, in every situation, whether it's home or family or whether it's work or whether it's friends, whether it's community? How do you show up? Uh, I don't know. I'm a good strategic thinker. Uh Uh-huh. But what about this? Blah, 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 blah. And he knew me well enough that he could knock down the things that didn't really fit. Um, And I said, well, I think I think big about things. I said, yeah. And what about this? Blah, blah, blah. So he could point out where there are plenty of instances in life and family and profession, everything else. And it took me about two and a half months. And one day I called him up and I said, Dave, I know what I am. I'm the possibility of harmony. And he said, yes, that's you. Because he knew me well enough. Everything I do, everything I've done in career, everything I do in my engagement with people is about trying to help people align with themselves, with with their workspace, their family space, their personal life, their goals. I'm about harmony, and I love harmony more than I love melody and music. I'm always attracted to the, the alto lines and the tenor lines more so than the soprano lines, because <laughs> harmony is where, where things really ha- take on a nuance and a beauty, often unexpected. So. The brother gave me one of my late life lessons. The student was, uh, ended up being my boss. (laughs) He was in the executive MBA program at Emory when I was in the MBA program, and I was teaching him and helping him through his calculus courses and his quantitative methods courses. But he was the one that taught me this lesson about leadership and building organizations. And the teacher, uh, it, it was and still is my mother who at 93, year old, 93 years old is still trying to teach me. So um, I will end with this. I always collect quotes and poems to, that help inspire me and help me think about things. And I will leave these two to you. Don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive, then go do it. Because what the world needs is for more people to come alive. Find your sense of purpose. Find what your possibility is. How do you show up to your colleagues here, to your family, in any community environment, any personal environment, and where there's a consistency of that, of where you're aligned with that, you'll find your sense of purpose and you'll feel a lot more fulfilled. At least I believe so. And then this quote from Mary Ann Williamson, that was often quoted by Nelson Mandela, who would give her credit, but he loved this quote himself, and so he would often use it. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, to be gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? And actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small doesn't serve the world. The point is you have greater possibilities than you're often willing to admit. So it's not being boastful. It's just being confident about who you are and what you have to offer to the world. And when you got that and you're aligned with your possibilities, a lot of things are possible. So thank you very much. Uh, any questions about anything, including the park or anything else? Yes, ma'am. Um, I was imagining in your time in Memphis that it was changes and it's moved to more positions. How oh, sure. Are you able to um, there's, to me, there are two elements of opposition. There are, well, actually, three elements of opposition. There are people who oppose because they don't know enough. They haven't learned enough information, and you need to figure out what it is that they don't know that they need to learn to understand better what the situation is. And very often, that group can find themselves agreeing with you, or even if they choose to still disagree with you, but respecting what you're doing. Okay. Um, then there's people who oppose out of fear, because something's changed, it's new, 
or you're eradicating or eroding a position that they have and trying to understand what that is and finding out is there a way to to harmonize or come to a uh, a mutual point that we can both agree on even if it's I don't get all of what I want and you don't get all of what you don't want and a lot of that fear often is change um, so, and then there's the third group and that's the people who oppose just to be opposition. It's a shame to say, but there are people who live their life that way. They get more comfort <laughs> out of disagreeing and being disagreeable, regardless of what it is. I can't work with the third group. The first group and the second group, I'll spend a lot of energy trying to work with. You know, if I can get them or many of them changing their mind, then we're likely to be successful going forward. The other thing, too, is I was trying to find the people who wanted to go to the dance with you. That's what I used to tell my colleagues all the time at ARC and even before then. When you're making change, people are always suspicious and fearful of change. Human beings, we have an evolutionary response to be suspicious or fearful of change, right? It's not safe. I'm safe right now. Change may make me unsafe. But there are always a small group of people and we know them in technology as first adopters who are willing to go out on that limb with you and try something new. But often they're quiet or silent. Find out who wants to go to the dance with you. And what I would say is when people see that you're having fun dancing, other people will come off the wall. Remember high school, wallflowers. People will come off the wall and join you in having fun. But they're not willing to risk be the first one. So you have to find the people who are a little more risk or innovation oriented who are willing to join you in that first step and then you begin to become a stream and become a river so those are my thoughts any no questions from the viewing audience okay all right oh, oh. okay he, he was he was trying to decide whether he was going to raise his hand or not, and he finally did. <laughs> It's a great question, a great set of questions. Uh, the answer to the first part, do I see people trying to learn from the mistakes or the experience of projects before? Yes. Um, I can tell you that very actively, A.J. Robinson, who's leading the Stitch, Anthony Rodriguez, who's leading Hub 404, both of whom have been uh, friends for many years, and I get together occasionally and we talk about our experience and what we're hoping to accomplish. And I know that we talk about things like how, we, how, how are our projects going to affect housing prices, how are they going to affect employment, so on and so forth. Uh, housing being the thing that most people are sensitive to nowadays, understandably so. Um, the unfortunate part, and this is your second question, we don't often control the land to be able to control the policy. And if we are working with a public partner like the city, often the city doesn't control the land either and hasn't thought about getting ahead of the thing. Um, unfortunately, local government, and this is not just the city of Atlanta, this is local government generally, is not designed by our country to be innovative. It's very risky for an elected official to be innovative in our, in our democratic politics, Democrat small d politics. Um, and when you find that leader who's willing to be, 
often they have a thousand one things to think of. So if, if they get the chance, they may be willing to go out on a limb with you, gain control to land that you can help think about those possible places, or even just put themselves in, out with the bully pulpit in the areas with the landowners and say, what can you do to help us with uh, rent control or housing control here? But that's very rare. I will say that Mayor Dickens is a supporter of the project. Um, we, because our project is mostly midtown real estate, there's not as much opportunity for affordable housing right now. And with the park, when the park becomes real, it's going to be less possibility. But we are talking with Midtown, at Midtown Alliance and hoping they can help us think about some strategy for mixed income redevelopment in some of their places with some of their owners. Also, to MARTA, we know they're going to do the TOD. So part of what we're hoping, they have a policy already to every TOD they do has to be mixed income with a, a large affordability element. So the first answer is yes. Second answer is not much. Mm -hmm. A lot of these types of projects are often led by community people civically oriented who approach state or local government. And again, they don't have necessarily control over the land to be able to do more of what they'd like to do in terms of those kind of negative effects. But I haven't run into any folks yet that aren't sensitive to what it is, just don't have the tools to be able to control it and guide it. So that's part of our body politic, unfortunately. Yes, sir. My question is, one of the areas that we want to do more work in is really affording sustainable, affordable housing. What advice do you have for us? Well, um, I think but the thing, two things. One that you're already doing is to show up um, in the regular conversations about housing affordability around the region. So I know you do that. But I think raising, be sure that you can get the leaders in those efforts to raise it as a part of their regular conversation. And I would say, try to get the mayor. The mayor has a huge impact, even in the private sector, by his words. I don't know to the degree to which he even has recognized that yet, having come through uh, one year in office. But, uh, but when you can get elected leaders to talk about not just housing affordability, but quality, sustainable housing development, along with affordability, that resonates into the private sector because then the private sector says, okay, we're seeing what's important to them. Let's come up with a solution that, that will satisfy what their interests are. Mm -hmm. Private sector often responds to the market and when it comes to housing affordability, a big part of the market is what local governments or public entities who control land have to say about how that's developed or redeveloped. So, uh, yes. Okay. All right.